I used to like to say that I like to live my life in the fast lane, and if you don't like it, get the hell out of the way, because I'm gonna keep going. And that really bit me in the butt one day back on June 12th, 2004. Hi, I'm Andy Burton. Uh, this is my brand new podcast, The Andy Burton Show. And I'm super excited to be able to share on this episode why I've created this podcast and the stories that we're going to share a little bit about myself, a little bit about my guests, and talk just really more in depth on these amazing people that I've met in my mortgage and real estate journey. Before we get into uh, my guests. I want to talk a little bit about my backstory, my origin story of what it was like for me and leading to this place that I'm at today, growing up in Hudson, Wisconsin, and coming from a small family in a small town in, in western Wisconsin, and how it brought me here where I'm only miles away, uh, but in almost like a totally different world than where I grew up. Going back to my family in my childhood, it was myself, my parents, and, and two siblings, and we lived the typical American blue-collar life, and my family having like a lot of fun experiences growing up. We were big into the outdoors and big into camping and spending time with our extended family, and uh, it was kind of the hellraiser of the group. And I was always a little bit on edge all the way down to first couple of weeks in kindergarten, already getting phone calls uh, to my parents on uh, me running into problems and throwing kids backpacks into the street, walking home from school and kind of started right from the very beginning that my mom said she even just wanted to ship me off to kindergarten to get me out of the house because I uh, was raising havoc from the very beginning. And that kind of carried on all the way through high school. School and structured environment was not the greatest thing for me uh, growing up. I think I had a great childhood and I have a lot of very, very fond memories uh, of that. Uh, when I got into high school, you know, I really struggled with being consistent with going to school and consistent with my education and applying myself and just turned into me getting into a lot of trouble. And I barely graduated high school. You know, I went, I had to go to alternative school for a while. I dropped out of high school, came back my senior year, took night school, summer school classes to literally graduate by the skin of my teeth. And I really feel like my school counselor and my principal just gave me a diploma to basically be like, get the hell out of here. That entered me kind of into my adult life. I always tested really well, but I graduated second from last in my class. So it's kind of funny to have that story to where I'm at now in life, which is literally like the complete opposite. It's like a different paradigm. It's not even the same world. And I, I truly believe, you know, 25, 30 years later that I had to go through the school of hard knocks to be able to give me clear direction on where I want to go. It wasn't that long after high school, five, six years after high school, I unfortunately went to that school. And I uh, learned with the near-death experience on, on I needed to change. And I had some wonderful friends at that time. Many of them I'm still friends with today, but it, we got wild and crazy and I ran fast. Um, I used to like to say that I like to live my life in the fast lane. And if you don't like it, get the hell out of the way because I'm going to keep going. I, I loved to act fast, think fast, drive fast. I love like horsepower and boats and bikes and fast cars. And some would say fast women and, uh, that really bit me in the butt one day back on June 12th, 2004. I was just north of where I grew up, only by about five miles. And uh, I was riding my 2002 uh, Yamaha R6 crotch rocket. And uh, I was going to a benefit and I was driving 155 miles an hour. Uh, going way too fast. It was a regular occurrence for me. Many people ask, why would you do that? I did it because I could. And fortunately, I couldn't find my sunglasses that day. So I put on my helmet, and uh, which I did. I rarely wore a helmet, honestly. And I was wearing a helmet. I was wearing 
tank top, flip flops, and shorts. So I realized I forgot my cell phone. So I turned around, cracked the whip, held it wide open, went over the top of a hill. And from what I believe, because I don't really recall a lot of this, I jumped the hill. I landed on the other side. I got head shake. That's where your bike shakes back and forth. I put the bike down on the road, went into the ditch. I hit a tree six feet in the air, spun around, hit a driveway culvert. And then I shot into the air and I landed 75 feet later into the ditch. When I hit the driveway culvert, I separated from the bike. The bike flew into the ditch. Like parts of the bike flew all over the street. I left my leg in the driveway culvert and cut my right leg right off. And I uh, landed in the ditch. I thought I was in a cornfield because I didn't really realize what was happening and what was going on. So I heard someone pull up, though. So I, like right away, I snapped out of it and I heard a voice and I heard someone. And what it was, was uh, someone driving by in the street. They looked down. They saw me. Uh, and they said, he's over here. So I tried to get their attention. So I was craw crawling through the grass. And then I realized I need to stand up because I think I'm way out into this cornfield. Uh, so I need to stand up and get their attention so they know where I am. So I want to stand up on my left leg and my left leg bent over into an L and I was standing on my right leg, which at this time just has a bone hanging out the end and I stood up and I waved them over and I fell back over. What I didn't realize was they were just right there. I was right in the ditch. I was basically in someone's front yard, just in the long uh, grass of their front yard, the ditch area where the grass started very close to where I was. I got their attention and I laid back and I started kind of doing my own hand tourniquet on my leg. Every time I would kind of tourniquet my leg and, and squeeze it, you know, I'd go from black and white to color. What it was, was the blood stopping uh, from shooting out of my leg. So my leg was 75 feet over, 13 feet inside the driveway culvert. So I went so fast that my leg severed off and my leg kept going and I kept going. So fortunately, these people that were driving by, they stopped. They uh, tourniqueted my leg with belts. They called 911. Uh, the ambulance came, you know, rather quickly they ended up uh taking my leg putting it on ice and sent me off uh to the hospital so that's where i thought i died uh along the way i i saw the light i had i was intubated meaning i had a breathing tube shoved down my throat they put me into a drug induced coma in the ambulance and i thought i died so i said goodbye to my family i saw the light and I woke up the next day in Regent's Hospital after having 12 hours worth of surgeries, patching my left leg back together, patching my right leg together. And that was the first day on the new journey of my life. So when I woke up in the hospital, it was like a new beginning. And I'll never forget seeing my parents and my grandma and my friends I had a couple of close friends were some of the first people that I got to see when I woke up and it was like uh, the start of a new beginning but much like a lot of things in life I didn't change overnight this didn't change me overnight I had a very long recovery and something that I learned about myself at that time is like I knew things probably needed to be different from here going forward. First of all, it was just the basics of I was in survival mode and that I needed to learn like just literally how to recover because I had a broken back, broken tailbone, lost my right leg, almost lost my left leg. It took a while. I was in so much pain and I was under so much drugs and medication. It wasn't like this immediate like snap. All of a sudden it's my new life because I was drugged up and it was really hard and it was really painful. It was survival of getting to the next day uh, in the beginning. But over time, as the medication wore off and I started to get clarity, I realized life needs to change. And I realized that the, the decisions I made here today, I can't be continue making these decisions. And it started with just small incremental changes over time for me there, seeing like, okay, I need to go into a new career path. At that time, I was a union construction worker. So now I'm going to have to start thinking about how can I 
apply myself with my brain versus with my body. During the time that I spent at home, this was some of the most valuable time of my entire life that I did not work for a year. And I got to spend a lot of time just sitting around, exercising, doing some reading, a lot of thinking. I really had never had that much time in my life. And I was really fortunate that my grandma Lois was the person that took care of me. So she would drive me to and from my therapy sessions and hospital sessions. And so I got to spend a lot of time with her. And something cool uh, about that was my grandpa was born with one hand. At this time, I got to learn more about my grandpa and what it was life like for uh, him and my grandma. And my grandma and grandpa met on the landing in downtown St. Paul while my Grandma was down on the landing to actually meet another guy. My grandpa pulled up in a tugboat with Sparky, uh, his co-captain, and he ends up meeting my grandma at the landing. They go on a date, and they're married 30 days later. And my grandpa was born with one hand, and he uh, worked his way up from being a deckhand. So he was pulling around giant barge ropes with one arm to becoming a captain or a pilot of a barge and I started to learn about him and get inspiration from him from my grandma that if my grandpa can do it if he did it with one hand I can do it with having half a leg so so I got to ask my grandma a lot of questions about my grandpa and what I was like because my grandpa only had a third grade education born with one hand and he died a millionaire in the 80s she said something that resonated with me to this day where she she said uh, that he would say the only way you can be handicapped is between the ears. And so I use that as like a, an inspiration to me that I can do whatever I need to do if I set my mind to it. And uh, so she was like a guiding force for me. And a lot of people were guiding forces for me at that time. It was between the doctors and the nurses and my grandma and my parents. They all help propel me up to say that I can do it. I can overcome this. And I just have an insanely, insanely resilient mindset. Like I'm like Rocky, you can knock me down, but I'm just going to keep getting back up. So that was the first steps on the journey of saying, okay, we're opening a new chapter. At this time, I didn't know where it was going to go, but I just knew that I, I had something to prove. I had like this chip on my shoulder that slowly built up incrementally over time that I fucked up, I screwed up my life and I needed to fix it. And now I got something to prove. So that began my journey of where am I going to go? What am I going to do with my life? All right, I need to find a new career. I need to start making some different decisions, of which some of them were still very bad. <laughs> Let's be really clear about that. It was still that high school hellion that I had in me that was slowly going away just a little bit. And uh, that's when I started looking at options for a career. I'm like, okay, what's the career path that I would like to go in? So I thought about it'd be really awesome if I could be a realtor, but I couldn't walk very well. I think maybe I could go into the mortgage industry. I, I was in real estate, meaning I was in real estate construction, new construction. Uh, so I knew how to frame homes, how to sheetrock homes, how to put in the basement. So I knew a lot about homes. I'm like, all right, I know a lot about houses. This is something I can easily transition maybe into a career just being on the other side of it, though. Maybe I'm going to be selling them or financing them. I was really fortunate that one of my good friends uh, was looking out for me and said, like, I have someone that you need to meet. And, this, and we were both into boating. I had power boats and he had a boat. So he brought me down to the marina and introduced me to a friend who was a real estate investor and mortgage banker. And he thought that we should connect. So he uh, introduced us and said that Todd's into real estate. Maybe you guys should chat. So I had to pursue Todd for like three, four months. I kept calling him and calling him. And it took a while for him to really get back to me and take me seriously that I think I want to be a mortgage broker at the time. And this is 2004, 2005, literally like the pinnacle of the real estate market at that time. Uh, what I didn't realize was the market was just speaking and we were just ready to come out of euphoria. So he introduced me to the mortgage industry and that was 
the beginning. I realized that from the recovery of my motorcycle accident, I had so many people that were helping me along the way, like the nurses, the doctors, my specifically my grandma that were coaching me and helping me along the way. What I started to realize in real estate and mortgage was no one was getting coached and helped through every step of the way of what does the next step entail? How do we avoid pitfalls? How do we become a successful homeowner? And I realized all of those things that I learned from my great doctors and nurses, I could bring that into the mortgage business, which absolutely needed at this time. This time in the mortgage and real estate industry, it was like used car salesmen selling people on terrible, terrible loans, terrible homes, and giving people really bad advice. So the industry needed this. And that was my inspiration of, I'm going to be a coach. I'm not only going to coach my clients, I'm going to coach my business partners on the skills that are needed in order to be a successful business person. So I was able to use everything that I learned from the experiences that I had in the motorcycle accident and apply that into the mortgage world. Fast forward 19 years later, when I got started in the mortgage industry, I started at the bottom and I climbed my way through and I built a team that has served thousands of clients. I have been a top 10 loan officer in the state of Minnesota for the last five years in a row. I've been a top 10 loan officer in the United States for my company for the last 10 years in a row. We've gotten every accolade there is from top 1% mortgage uh, originator to Waterstone Mortgage Champion Awards to Diamonds Clubs. We have every accolade there is, and it's all falling back to the mindset that I learned after my motorcycle accident on communication on coaching in the industry now it's closing on time and realizing that the resiliency that I learned from how do I go from transitioning from a wheelchair to a uh, prosthetic leg and learning how to walk again was invaluable in business and that's the reason why we are so successful today and we just keep being successful year over year over year for our clients. And I am seeing that our industry needs advisors. We need coaches. Our clients need more advice than ever because it's very complicated. And that's why I wanted to have this podcast to be able to introduce the community to who the best in the business are and learn a little bit about their origin story, learn a little bit about their backgrounds. Just like I have a very, very unique background. I want to uncover this background for my business partners in real estate and introduce you to who they are. So I'm glad you're here and I'm super excited for you to subscribe to the podcast and I get to introduce you to the best in real estate on the Andy Burton show.